internet is a set of open protocols about IP on them. Um, all the things that basically created all the billionaires in the world in the last few years have been basically internet, a lot of it's, uh, a fair amount of it's been internet related, and a lot of that has been driven by a core. There's proprietary services built on top of them, but there's a mixture of these things. Is India innovative? Is India dynamic? Yeah, they are. That's why a lot of these groups are kind of concerned about India, because they can't really, they have an anxiety that they can't compete against India, just like they have an anxiety that manufactured people can't compete against Against, uh, against China. I mean, India is a dynamic sector as far as services, or, uh, as software, generic drugs at this point, things like that. So they are pretty innovative. I mean, I, I first went out to India in 1996, and I can't tell you the difference between 1996 and now is like mind-boggling for me. I thought, I thought India was like a really backward third world country in desperate poverty, and there was just it was a squalor, it was just something else. Now you go out there, it seems like a completely different country. They are really going through a change right now. So I think that to suggest that somehow you're doing it for their good, that they don't know what they're doing, I mean, the rate of growth they have, boy, you would love to have that rate of growth in the United States, I'll tell you, and we don't. Uh, just uh, before you answer this, Rapani, and this might help you maybe respond, perhaps. I mean, India has a very large uh, population of engineers, perhaps one of the largest in the world? I don't know. I know the universities put out a lot of engineers. Is that causing the Indian government in some ways to, to consider changes to its IP laws? I'm just, once again, I'm just asking questions here. I, I don't know much about this subject. I, I don't have an answer to that. I, I like to tell you my father is one of those engineers who left the, the country um, to study elsewhere, but he's also one of those engineers that's returned. And the last panel also talked about that dynamic, the dynamic now between the United States and India. What I would like to say is I, I really dispute this idea that intellectual property somehow is what's going to encourage innovation in India. I mean, in fact, it does the exact opposite. It, it um, prevents access to these technologies. And some of the most interesting innovations which have emerged from India over the last decade have been because of the lack of intellectual property rights. Um, some of the best examples, again, from a very limited perspective has been um, the development of many new vaccines from India, uh, for instance, from the Serum Institute, which was able to access NIH-funded vaccines um, the, um, sorry, vaccine technologies that were able to build a platform for them to develop many new innovative vaccines that are now being used around the world. Um, for instance, a vaccine for meningitis A, which uses NIH technology and then received a combination of public and private funding, which has allowed for the development of a vaccine that costs 50 cents a dose that is basically going to eradicate meningitis A across West, um, West Africa. So I, I think from our perspective, actually, again, if we take the example from the past, it's the access to these technologies, it's the ability to adapt them, it's the ability to use them that's actually going to encourage more people to stay in India to be able to use these technologies and to be able to develop the new innovations that we actually need around the world. Uh, Ms. Maybard, Maybar, uh, just for maybe 45 seconds, my time's already expired, thank you. No problem. Uh, we will submit more precise comments for the record, but to comment on the issue of foreign direct investment and the relationship to intellectual property, my understanding of the literature <clears throat> is that this does not speak directly to the types of issues that are actually at hand. That is, the question of beyond generalized standards in the TRIPS agreement, what measures are increasing or aren't, uh, or aren't increasing investment. My understanding is the literature does not address that, and that there isn't a literature really showing a relationship between these types, these questions about particularized standards. So I bring it, I bring it back to that. I mean, the, we can't speak in generalizations about intellectual property. Patents, trademarks, copyrights, data protection, each has particular rules governing it, particular types of economic impacts. And uh, it's worth mentioning as well that claims that we've seen made with regard to jobs in the American market are often attributed to intellectual property in general, which with, we would say, some very tenuous claims as to figures. If you actually tie them to the types of trips plus patent rules we're talking about today, they're there aren't claims, there aren't studies, as far as I'm aware, drawing, making these correlations. All right, thank you all. And if any of you do have studies, Mr. Shapiro, you mentioned that you looked in support. I think Mr. Hunter, perhaps as well, your organization has. If you could uh, provide those to the ITC or let us know where we could find them. I'm happy, I'm happy, yeah, I'm happy to provide a bibliography. You know, all right. This economic literature is quite extensive. All right, thank you. And thank you all for your responses. Mr. Thank you. Um, this is a difficult issue, and I, you know, the, the access issue tears at everybody's heart. And, and, and as I wrestle with this, and I'm just getting into it, I have a fairly simplistic understanding of things at this point. Um, I kind of try to bring things back to my own life, and, and I have two kids that are 
Bob's uh, in their 20s now, but I'm still recovering from uh, the day that the MRSA virus went through the high school weight room. And it was a scary thing. And we, you know, and I, I guess my question is, is there a connection here between the trade agenda, what we kind of need from the world in terms of intellectual property protection, and attracting the capital that we're going to need to solve these drug-resistant uh, antibiotic issue that we need. We need to develop these products because we can see the crisis coming. And where is that capital going to come from if, if we're going to be giving away a lot of these drugs or, or giving them away at a much lower price? Yeah, I'm really happy you asked that question because this is a problem that doesn't only affect today the United States and other developed countries, but in our operations we're seeing very high rates of antibiotic resistance and we're losing a lot of patients because we don't have the new antibiotics we need. Now let's think about antibiotics. There's, there's two characteristics of them. The first is that patients and governments expect to pay very low prices for them. The second is that we have to conserve them because if you overuse antibiotics, you get new strains such as MRSA appearing in, in hospitals and weight rooms and in other places. So what's happened? We used to have a very healthy antibiotic pipeline, but most pharmaceutical companies disinvested from this field over the last decade, including, as I mentioned, Pfizer basically selling off its division. Why did they disinvest? Because they didn't see any profitability in there. So this is the problem that now exists is how do you create a profitable market for new antibiotics when there is no commercial incentive? So what has happened? Uh, the United States has basically written a blank check to pharmaceutical companies to develop these drugs because there is no commercial incentive for these products. The United Kingdom has done the same thing for GlaxoSmithKline. The US basically says if you develop an antibiotic, we'll hand you a lot of years of additional exclusivity for other products. It's called the GAIN Act. In the United Kingdom, they basically wrote a $100 million check to GSK. So we've now gotten to a place in which one of the most important drugs that we need in our public health care systems cannot be financed through a trillion dollar pharmaceutical market and through a market in which, as the companies themselves say, they're spending lots on research and development. The system breaks down. It's broken. Now, it's been broken for us for, uh, for multiple decades because our patients simply do not have enough to pay. It's increasingly being broken for Americans and for others because there is no commercial incentive to develop these products. So governments are now scrambling to funnel lots of money into uh, pharmaceutical companies to pay for these products. And that's a real problem, and that's what the patent system cannot um, deal with. Okay, I just respond? Uh, Rick, uh, Richard Bergstrom is the, uh, is, is the head of the, uh, what, what's like pharma, but except for Europe, it's the European uh, version of pharma. And uh, he has said that the idea of linking uh, the R&D reward to the, to, to the price of the product for antibiotics is, is a bad system because you have a temporary monopoly and then the company has an incentive to, you know, to market it and that runs counter to the conservation goals you have uh, for antibiotics. And uh, there's also this sort of thing that uh, Rohi mentioned it from a private point of view, you have incentive to use antibiotics not just for humans but for agriculture. Uh, to make chickens grow faster and feed salmon and things like that. Every time you use it, you get a private benefit that is a social negative value because you breed resistance to the product. And so the infectious diseases of America, they, what, they, what they want is they want a fee put on the, the use of antibiotics, including for agricultural use, and to have that money be used to pay in part for the cost or as different rewards. Now, Bergstrom and in, in Europe, what he wants is to use innovation inducement prizes, very large ones, very large ones, in order to incentivize people to develop new antibiotics so that you don't have to sell a lot of copies of the drug to get your money back, but you get it in cash through, through the innovation prize. And he perceives that the antibiotics problem is different than the other drugs, that it presents these unique characteristics of, of the trade-off between conservation and, and utilization. But, but there, there, are, uh, there is a, a fairly extensive dialogue on this, and, and, and for the record, we will, be, uh, uh, we, we will submit uh, information about that. Thank you. Mr. Hunter, did you have a uh, I, um, I must say, I'm not, I'm, I hadn't been involved in the um, policy development in the U.S. Of the, um, around antibiotics, but we will make a submission relating to, to the antibiotics. Um, you know, the... <laughs> It's a closed set. The incentives, you know, it's either paid for because there's a market incentive. Um, it's paid for because there's a weak market incentive, which is then reinforced through a prize or, or some other mechanism, some other subsidy. 
or or it's publicly financed. Um, there's um, uh, the only question is you know uh, what is the tolerance for public financing and what's the tolerance? What are the terms under which you get private financing? Um, and those are trade-offs. Um, it, it, it does strike me that the problem with uh, the development of resistance to antibiotics, something which I experienced in a foreign country, um, that is a, a strep infection that they were insisting on treating with penicillin, which was having no effect. Um, because in that country there was not very much uh, penicillin resistant strep. Um, uh, it's not a, there's no relationship between that problem, certainly in intellectual property rights. The problem was the over, the over prescription, the over use of it by physicians um, and who didn't understand the danger in large, uh, um, in large part. It's, um, um, uh, so I don't really see it as, as, as very directly. I take exception to the idea that it's physicians who don't understand how to use these products. Who did? Our doctors are being forced to use wide spectrum antibiotics in resource poor settings because they don't have the diagnostics which are needed. The diagnostics which we're able to use in the United States in order to diagnose these diseases, the diagnostics are based on the patent system just as much as drugs are not operational in poor settings and often don't identify the antibiotic strains that we are, uh, antibiotic uh, microbiome resistant strains we have in poor settings. So I really want to be clear, when doctors are using these drugs, there is problems with rational use. In a lot of cases, including very highly trained doctors that come from the United States for MSF and work in other countries, they simply are trying to save people's lives. If, if, okay, just let me know the diagnostic, because that, that, that's really, uh, in, in the studies that Rand and other people have done, they, they, they sort of model this thing where suppose you had a 20% chance that if you take an antibiotic, if you're a doctor, it's going to be a benefit to the patient that it may be a, you know, a very severe illness that would be accumulated by it. But you can't distinguish the 20% from the 80% chance. That means you're, you're prescribing the antibiotic four times out of five for people that don't really need it. But still rational to do it from the point of view of that patient at that moment. But if you did have a better diagnostic, you would not prescribe it for patients that didn't need it. The problem is that what, what they're really looking for is a very low-cost diagnostic at point of care. Uh, and the patent system is a weird thing for that because you're, you're trying to develop a product which is basically has almost a zero price. And so that's another example where innovation inducement prices have been held as a better idea. The, the, the challenge is to scale up the funding so it's, it's not like a million dollars or something, it's more like a hundred million dollars or, you know, in the case of a drug, billions of dollars. And that may require cross-border funding of the cost of these innovation projects. I think the trade issue has to be getting countries outside of the United States to join with the United States and collaborate in funding the cost of rewarding successful investments in innovation in a framework other than through high prices because there's a whole set of problems where high prices don't even begin to address the innovation problem you have. And they certainly wreck havoc with, with the access. But I think that they, certainly the diagnostics are really a critical component of any solution on the, on the antibiotic side. Okay. Okay. Mr. Keith? Just to thank the witnesses so much. And uh, I look forward to reading whatever you can submit. Uh, we, I will pour over it. Thank you very much especially for uh, coming in the weather and being flexible because of the weather. Does any other commissioner have any questions? No. Good. Um, sure, like this panel, does the staff have any questions for our panel? Uh, Mr. Chairman, we would also like to thank the witnesses for coming, rescheduling and staying late, but we have no questions. Good, okay. And I to extend a thanks to you for staying late on this Valentine's Day. Um, so closing statement, post-hearing briefs, Statements responsive to questions and request of the Commission and corrections to the transcript must be filed by February 25, 2014. All of written statements must be filed by April 11, 2014. And with that, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you.